I think I'm on. There you go. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. And as you know, by nature of habit, I like to do a little bit of review. And I'm going to kind of set the stage and I'm just going to have you fill in some answers as I kind of go through the backdrop of uh, chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 was during the reign of Belshazzar. Daniel prayed in response to reading the prophet who? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And then in response to that, God sends the angel Gabriel. Very good. And uh, right away, comes right away, just even when he's still praying, the response comes back. And uh, Daniel is confessing his sin and the sin of the people and calling on God to do what? What is he calling on God to do that? He says, now, what is he asking God to do? Forgive. Forgive. Yep. What else? Yeah, restore. Fulfill the promise. You 70, 70 years, and now the 70 years is up. Do what you are going to do. And so God does that. He confirms that message that he would indeed do as he said he would. And the angel, in response, describes the time frame broken into what kind of components? He had something plus something plus something, and what? What was it? Seventy sevens, or groups of seven, and we, we term that, we define that as really years as it turns out. And then it was, uh, that 70 was broken into three groupings. What were they? The first one was seven, and then there was 62. And that was the accumulation of 69. My homeschool math room comes up with that. 70 is still one week missing. And between that 69th week and the 70th week, we term that as being what? Church age. The church age. Very good. So we are living in the midst of the church age between the 69th and 70th week. A couple of keys to... <laughs> we might be at 69.99999, right? We don't know that for sure, but it sure seems like it at times. And a key to remembering that Daniel, in his perspective, when he's thinking about this, he's thinking about the nation of Israel, right? He doesn't necessarily, although I think spiritually he probably has a sense for the, the all-inclusiveness of the message um, and how it spreads throughout the ages, his mind, his focus is on the people of Israel, and so is God. God is definitely focused in on his people. And so we are grafted in through Christ, but his message, his, remember the language changed between chapter, um, actually chapter 2 through 7, and then it changed to 8 and 9, 10, 11, the rest of it is in Hebrew, indicating that God is focused again back on not the time of the Gentiles, but on, uh, actually, on the time of uh, the church age and, and then the final finality for the for the people of Israel. Um, seems like I had one other thing I wanted to mention here. Are there any questions before we dive into chapter 10? Okay, all right. Well, gosh, either you're not awake yet or I've really done an awesome job of giving you all the information or there's just so much to learn. I think that's the third one. Maybe um, I wasn't listening. Huh? Maybe I wasn't listening. Okay. So, Ron, any questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> all right. Let's go into Daniel chapter 10. So, actually, 10, 11, and 12... Daniel chapter 11, 10, 11, and 12 are composed or, or have the final uh, message that Daniel, the final revelation, the final vision that Daniel received, all in all three chapters. It expand, uh, spans through 
chapter 10, 11, and 12. And so this is the final experience that Daniel had. Remember, he was an old man at this point in time. He was 80 plus, maybe even into his 90s, and uh, when he wrote this down. And so as we dive into this, we're not going to necessarily go chapter 10 today, chapter 11 next Sunday, and chapter 12. Of course, I can never get them done in one week anyways, but um, we're probably going to go chapter 10, don't hold me to this, Chris, all the way through to the middle of chapter 11 or around verse 20 is that's my target anyways and uh, so just so you know this whole thing is all talking about and as you want to summarize it a great war a great war and it surfaces throughout different ages but it is still the same great war and we're going to study that here as we dive into chapter 10 so let me start and we'll, we'll uh, read, talk through some different things, answer some questions, and dig out what God has for us this morning. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. So as we look at chapter 1, or verse 1, what does it tell us? What, what is the time period here? The third year of Cyrus. Third year of Cyrus, king of the Persians. So is that before or after Darius? Darius the Mede. Huh? Actually, Darius the Mede was first, and then Cyrus was king after that. And who was it that gave the command for the Israelites to go back to Israel? Anybody remember? It was actually not Darius or Darius. It was Cyrus in his first year. So we are in the third year of Cyrus's reign. And who's still in Babylon? Daniel is. Daniel did not go back to Israel, though he prayed for it. He confessed his sins. He was kind of, I would call, the spiritual leader of calling on God to bring his people back in to Israel, to return to Israel as promised in the prophet Jeremiah. But Daniel did not go back with them. Why do you suppose that is? I mean... Like, Moses didn't go into the promised land, right? And we know why that happened. Because he sinned, right? He got angry and struck the rock and... He was pretty old. He was pretty old. That was a long journey back then. It's not like hopping on a 747 and flying across. Okay? Why else maybe he didn't go? Yeah, his governmental duties may have prevented him. In other words, he was somebody of importance in Babylon. It's not like just taking the guy who had his, his uh, meat shop and the guy who was a blacksmith or whatever. We're talking one of the leaders of the government. And maybe Cyrus wasn't willing for him to go, wasn't willing to have him leave. Why would God want him to stay in Babylon? Oh, you mean God might want him to stay there. What are we going to say? Okay, he was an example. And what else? Obedient. He was definitely obedient. Yeah, I, I like that. I think the other thing is that God put Daniel in power for a reason. And we kind of saw it happen over and over again. He was there to help protect the Jewish nation to make sure that they didn't um, they didn't lose their identity while in the captivity of Babylon. Notice again, we can just go back, touch a couple of points of Daniel's life, but he prayed to towards Jerusalem. The uh, he remember he he recognized 
times of day as it related to the church service or the temple worship that they had. I mean, he was definitely focused on that. But here's a quick question. You probably don't know the answer, but how many people, how many people that were in Babylon went back with that first group? Does anybody know? Steve probably knows, but he's not going to say. How many people went back? Was it millions? Hundreds of thousands? All of them that went back. Exactly. Well, there are a few that died along the way. But yes. Um, no, there's 49,000. 49,000 out of all of those people that were taken into captivity. That's not very many. And there were several different instances where people made the, the, the uh, uh, journey back to Israel. So the first one, the first group, was only 49,000. And so they were going back to rebuild the temple. That's in the book of Ezra. So Daniel still had a responsibility. He was still needed in Babylon. I think it's pretty clear to that, but he was also maybe too old for the journey. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. We're just hypothesizing here, but I think it's, it's kind of curious to note that God's still in control and still cares about his people, even though the temple in Jerusalem is starting to get rebuilt. So. I think the best way we can say that, Dan, uh, Daniel followed God so close. I mean, there's such a uh, communion with God that we can say that uh, God, Daniel's work as far as God was concerned was not done yet. There. And so God kept him there. He stayed, he didn't stay because he didn't want to go with the rest of them. Right. So, uh, yeah, exactly, Dick. I think God wanted him to be there. And that's why he's there. So let's read on in chapter 10. And we're going to actually pick up. And we're going to read a bunch of verses here. Well, not that many this time. Well, next time we will. All right. Chapter 10, verse 2. At that time, I, Daniel... Oh, I did want to say one thing. Sorry. Before we dive into that. Notice it's kind of in the third person. It's the first verse seemed confused me for a little while. I'm going, why? Is it a vision that he had, or is this a vision he's having, or that sort of thing? And it's kind of like the preamble of a long novel. This preamble just basically says, and during the third year of Cyrus, Persia, a revelation was given. Now let me tell you about that revelation. Okay, so it just kind of sets the stage. Um, I, I struggled with that a little bit, but I, I think I'm in a good place on it right now. So... Verse 2, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotion at all until the three weeks were over. Okay, so verse 2 and 3. Okay, so why was Daniel fasting and praying? Why was he mourning? What do you think? Okay, so he maybe hadn't gotten the answer to what he was praying for. We will get there for the answer coming to him. But that answer, that, that prevention that was, uh, you know, the king of the prince of the Persian, um, Persians, um, that happened during the 21 days. But what led Daniel to start the 21 days? What led him to start fasting and praying and not eating choice food and not using any lotion on his old wrinkly skin. What, what forced him or what led him to, to, to start the prayer? Yeah, so he had had re, uh, revelations coming to him all along, right? So if you read into history a little bit, you find out that when the 49,000 that were released and, go, uh, and went to um, Jerusalem to start rebuilding the temple, they did not fare very well. And they had a lot of opposition. And the fact that only 49,000 people went 
probably all fed into Daniel's kind of consternation over the whole situation going, man, this is not going very good, God. I expected hundreds of thousands of people to go, and they, you know, it took them, well, how long did it take them to rebuild the temple? Does anybody remember? It was, came to us from chapter 9 in the prophetic uh, verse, but then now we know from history that it took how long? Seven times seven. Anybody math? Twice? 49 years. Very good. So this is, you know, fulfilled in prophecy. It took him 49 years. Daniel probably had a hard time with that, too. That's a long time. That's half a lifetime. And so he was thinking, man, this is not going very well, God. Yeah, but I think, I, I understand what you're saying, Ann. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The vision or the need to pray and fast? I think that the vision came in response to the praying and the fasting. So did Nehemiah, was he in Babylon? Nehemiah is going to be several hundred, or a hundred years later. He's going to be kind of like the last group that gets brought over and they rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. Okay. You know, it doesn't explicitly tell us why. All we can do is infer of what Daniel was going through as far as what led him to be in prayer and fasting. But for sure, it was predicated upon his concern for the Jewish people and, and how they were faring. He wanted them to be restored to Israel. He wanted them to have the temple and the temple worship again. He wanted their nation to be restored. And I think he was just... He was getting bummed out because it wasn't going very good, and so he was praying and fasting, which is probably not the only time he did such a thing. But this is his final vision. This is his final revelation that he received. He's an old man at this point in time, and as Dick said, God wasn't done with him yet. So as we look at this, we're going to dive in a little bit further, and again, I'm going to power us through some of this this morning. Verse 4, and I'm going to read through verse 11. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men that were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, thanks a lot, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and I, as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had said this to me, I stood up trembling. Wow. Well, let's start with some of the details here, and then we'll dig into the experience. Some of the details, he was at the river Tigris, on the banks of the Tigris, the great river. Was this along the shore of the uh, Babylon, the city, or not? Does anybody know? It actually is not. The Euphrates is the one that goes right through Babylon. The Tigris is further south, and this is a bigger river. He was obviously stationed there or in that vicinity with some other people when he had this final vision. Okay. I don't know what the significance of that is other than um, Babylon was no longer the kingdom. It was Persia was in charge now, and so Babylon was just another city in that 
in that area. So <clears throat> we have a man dressed in linen up here, a vision, a, a person. Um, scholars are split on who this is, almost like right down the middle. I've, I've looked at it, I'm going, which, which one is it? So I'm going to give you both. But who do you think he is? Who do you think this man in linen is? Could have been Christ. Have been Christ. Half the scholars think that it was. An angel. The other half think that it was an angel. So let's, let's un unpack their viewpoints and see why they think this. And, and really, it's, it is a significant detail, but it is not an imperative detail to have agreement on. So the reason that I say that is that the vision is true. The messenger, the identity of the messenger isn't necessarily affecting the message. It's just the avenue that God chose to bring it to Daniel. So scholars are split. The description mirrors, if you look to Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, we're not going to flip over there because it's almost word for word, the description of what uh, Daniel described this person as uh, in the vision. The, the, uh, the finest gold around his waist, his body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming fire. It's like reading the verse that describes Christ in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. So it's, it's very, very similar, almost in the same order. Um, so that's, that's a tremendous reason to think that this may be Christ. So why does uh, Revelation describe Jesus Christ? Exactly. Exactly the same. Okay. So the description really is very similar. The overwhelming aws awesomeness of the presence. In other words, in Acts, we have Saul on the road to Damascus, and he has this experience. It's very similar to this experience here. He heard the voice, and it impacted him, right? But the others that were with him did not, but they were sort of terrified. They were all scared of what was going on. It was like this presence that they couldn't understand or un explain. And in that case, who was it that was speaking to Saul? It was Jesus Christ. Okay, so those are, are reasons why scholars are, are inclined to think that this would be Christ in this presence. Um, but on the flip side, and we'll get into this today, as a matter of fact, in the next couple of verses. On the flip side, here is Jesus, if this is Jesus. And again, it's not one of those critical doctrinal things that we have to have a definitive on. But if it is Jesus, I have maybe a hard time thinking that he needs help against the prince of Persia from the archangel Michael. That's, that doesn't quite sit well with me when I think about that. I'm going, okay, well, no, wait a second here. Jesus needs help against this demon. Now, unless he chose to demonstrate something for us, and that's what the scholars who think that this is, is uh, Jesus in this vision. So, we don't know for sure. And... Uh, I, I think that each one of us can make up our own mind, but I think the key points here that comes along with it are important to draw out. And what happens when, when Daniel experiences this vision? What happens? How does he respond? How does he respond? I can't do it because I have my coffee in my hand, but I'm kind of thinking like, like this, right? <coughs> All the way down. Right? And then after, boy, this is really booming down here. All right. And then, then he gets lifted up, right? And he's on his hands and knees. He's still not very upright, right? He's uh, getting touched and God is helping him up. But he's definitely so afraid, or so old, but so afraid that he's prostrate before this vision. That's pretty, pretty significant. Daniel probably had people kind of bow out of his way normally as he was one of the leaders inside of that nation. 
um, even after the transition to the Persians. So what are some other things that struck you out of this whole section that we just read? He saw it, but nobody else saw it. They felt it, but they didn't see it. And they didn't hear the words. Right? It was a message for Daniel. This is not his first time to the rodeo. That is true. He's had lots of visions and, and things before. And had similar responses in some of those where he felt overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, they they see Daniel fall down, and he's his face is ash and white. Maybe we're thinking of applying CPR or something like that. But but you're right. They they obviously saw something and felt something that was going on. Yeah. Something like that would be where God would reveal something that we would just have, we would just fall, we would just fall down. Yep, we would just fall down just because of the awesomeness of God's presence. Yeah. Yep. He knows that the vision is coming from God, and so that is also another reason that he's falling down. I agree. I agree. A couple of other thoughts uh, uh, that I wanted to share is um, when people experienced angels in the Old and New Testament, oftentimes they also fell down, and they were awestruck by that. You just think about when um, uh, some, of the, some of the different experiences that, that we have in the scriptures there. And then the other thing I thought about here is we know that this wasn't Gabriel. How do we know that this wasn't Gabriel? Well, other times when it was Gabriel, he mentioned Gabriel. Yeah, he mentioned Gabriel. As a matter of fact, he recognized him as being Gabriel, right? He said, oh, this is the same guy that came to me before. His name is Gabriel. I mean, that was in chapter 9. So. Clearly, he recognized this was a different person from Gabriel. It was also a different person from Michael. It wouldn't have been described in this same, same way. So we just don't know for sure. All right. I, I'm not convinced. Um, maybe that's, that's a good way. You guys may have, have been convinced. But to me, um, I think that, that this is a, an amazing experience, but it just shows the gravity of the message that he's bringing. <laughs> it is true. We kind of are suspicious of anybody who has a divine revelation from God, right? It's kind of like, uh oh, this is another cult starting. I mean, we just we do have that um, that that perception, and uh, God definitely reveals Himself, and I think in different ways today than He has in the past, such as in the Old Testament and New Testament. Not to say that He can't, because Joel talks about how He will reveal Himself to His people. But yeah, go on. He sure did when he was on earth. He limited his power. Yep. And he's still limiting his power because he has, he'd have all kinds of power to uh, do things on earth here with us if, uh, if he was going to do it. 
And so to your point, Ron, yeah, if, if he wanted to limit his power, he could, and he does today. Yeah. And then I, my response would be, what does he teach us with that? And we're going to get to it in a moment. So it's a, it's a, good, a good observation. All right. We're going to get to there in just a minute, Ann. Thank you for leading me right to my next section. I appreciate that. So we're going to get into and why he was held up. Um, one other thing I do want to just bring up before we dive into that, and that is, well, two other things. One is that oftentimes we don't necessarily show the respect to God when we meet together or when we are in our own prayer times. We have a tendency to um, think of Jesus as our buddy, as our pal, as our friend, and he is all of that, but he is also the savior of the world. He is also God who has created all of this. He is the holy God and the God who's gonna judge the heavens and the earth. And so um, I just don't want us to leave off and just say, oh, well, he was impressed by the whole experience. I think we need to take it to heart to say, okay, in my own prayer time, am I really humbling myself before God? Am I really impacted by the fact that I am talking to the God of the universe? And so I just, I want, to, I want us to just consider that and think about that because it obviously impacted Daniel. Daniel was a good example for us to look at. And I think the other thing is that's significant here is that he was so impacted that it was only through God's touch, either through Jesus or through an angel, but it was God's touch that strengthened and encouraged him. And as so much so that he wasn't able to receive the vision, we're going to see this kind of repeat again, he's not going to be able to go forward until God encourages and strengthens him. And sometimes the message that God has for us is hard to, dis to take in. And uh, Daniel certainly was living that. Yeah, how do, we, how do we commit ourselves to following? Yeah, yeah, our country has, and like the nation of Israel did, but you know what, in other respects, we individually are responsible too, aren't we, Ann, to respond. Yeah. If we look at our own world units so much, it looks like we're not very good. <laughs> it's true. That's true. We're not measuring up as well as we should. Okay. So let's go into verse twelve through fourteen. Where this is kind of Ron, where you and, and Anne wanted to lead me a moment ago, but I had a few things I wanted to to talk about. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, in other words, to start praying, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So, in response to Daniel's humbling himself, fasting, and prayer, God sends this messenger, 
notice I'm being careful there, trying to be. I'll probably trip up and call him one or the other as I go through it. But he sends his messenger with this message, and he encounters the prince of Persia. So describe to, you, to me what you think is happening here. Describe for me what you think is happening here. Satan is hindering the message for all people. Kind of fits with his modus operandi, doesn't it? Okay. So let me ask a probing question. Do you think that there is a prince of the kingdom of Greece? What do you think? Not in the same way? Why do you say that? Okay, but there's a prince of the kingdom of Persia. Do you agree with that? And do you think this is a, a fallen angel or, or a good angel? A fallen angel. Okay, I agree with that. I think it's pretty clear that this is an opposition to God's message that makes sense. If you read down a few verses a little bit later on, he says, and when I'm done with this message, I'm going to go fight the king of Persia or the prince of Persia again and then the prince of Greece will come so he knows what's lined up for him it's kinda of like one army after another or one battle after another that he's preparing for so I take that to mean that there is a prince over every one of these kingdoms that's influencing for negative the kingdoms of this world so do you think that there is a prince of Great Britain or a prince of United States. Okay, so she says must be Satan then. I'd buy that. But, it, but there's a prince of Israel who is the who? The Archangel Michael. Interesting. So is there a evil component and a good component to every one of these nations that are battling for influence over this world? What do you think? Have you ever thought of it? Right, and you would say, okay, we think of 1939 Germany, and there was definitely a prince of Germany that was influencing somebody there, a leader, right? I mean, we don't have a hard time stretching it to that. Yeah. Yeah, a demon. And we know... Go ahead, it's two. Well, it teaches and talks about um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of, you know, heavenly... There's, and, and so there's, there's things going on that we just don't... I think there's multiple times in time, in history, in future, and... Yep. And what Stu is referring to is Ephesians 6.12, where we say that we are wrestling not against flesh and blood. Again, in Romans after, chapter 8, it talks about us wrestling against the principalities of this world. And so I don't find it hard to believe at all that behind the scenes, there is a spiritual battle going on that we have no visibility of, but we are definitely influenced by. No, that evil influence is not all-powerful because we can see that Michael came and helped out this person 
and was able to free him to be able to go on, and then this person was going to circle back and get back into the fray as soon as he was done with his message. See, I think there's, you know, Frank Peretti has written some books that are kind of intriguing. They're not gospel, they're not scriptural or anything like that, but Piercing the Darkness and all of these, I don't know if you, how many of everybody read any of those books? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about, that they kind of stir the heart to think, oh, wow, there's more going on here, and, and our imagination can really start to play with us, but are demons real? Absolutely. Are they alive and Unwell today? Yes, absolutely. Are they active in the world? Yes. Are they active in individual people's lives? I think so. Are they influencing nations? I have no reason from the scriptures to think that they don't. Well, you bet. We have, still have free choice, don't we? Yep as a nation as well as individuals. And let's not be quiet. It sure can. Physical warfare can definitely Excuse me, spiritual warfare can definitely lead into physical warfare. We have evidence of that in the scriptures in, in uh, the New Testament times where seven sons of a Jewish high priest try to exercise this guy and they get beat up by this one person uh, uh, because, oh, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And he, ma he masters them all. So I think we can see that there's a physical component to this as well as a spiritual component. I find it really intriguing and interesting that each nation has a, a component to this. And I believe that there is an angel, a fallen demon, whatever you want to call it, of the United States that's really getting very powerful. And the influences of good are not as strong as they maybe were once. Yep. So what did God do? What did Daniel do? He, he humbled himself. What did God do? He came in and, and, and sent his archangel to, to free up this individual to be able to come with the message because the message is important. So, let me treat, catch up here. Oh, here's a follow-on. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, and this is not the first time, right? It's been this overwhelming theme that God just looks at Daniel and goes, man, you are, you're good stuff. I like you. <laughs> you know, and it's not that he's favoring Daniel. It's just that Daniel's heart is aligned with God's purposes and, and God is using him. And he's not afraid to humble himself. Yeah, yeah, it is encouraging. Um, so one of the, the commentary, commentaries wrote or commentators wrote about, well, whether or not we each individually have our own guardian angels. Right, and um, so the, the way he phrased it is, uh, do, you, do you think that we each have a guardian angel? And he answered, no. There's got to be a lot of them to keep me out of trouble, and I think that's really true. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of them. I think there is a lot of influence in our lives from, from on God's perspective to watch over and encourage us, to touch us, to help us, to guide us. God's messengers to us, not necessarily in visions and dreams, but also in the way that he, he touches our lives in, in thousands of ways. Okay, such good stuff. I mean, I'd hope to get through half of chapter 11 today. We're not even, I'm going to get through chapter 10, but it's going to be tough. All right. Verse 15. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who, I looked, like, who looked like a man touched my lips, 
and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed. Here it is again, Rosie. He said, Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me from, uh, uh, except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius Amid, I took my stand to support and protect him. Okay, lots of stuff in this little bit of uh, scripture here. Again, Daniel being overwhelmed by his experience with the, uh, with the uh, vision. Yes, Steph. It's a good question, and in my Bible, it has a lowercase Lord, which indicates that um, the person who translated it had this perspective that it was an angel and not God or Jesus Christ, but I don't know if that's definitive enough to lead us one way or the other. That's a very good question. I wondered that too, is, you know, and there are places where, you know, uh, where the connotation is that, that he would describe um, a person as Lord, um, and yet it was not talking about God. It is showing a perspective of humility, however, which I think is important to note. <clears throat> Daniel definitely was a humble man, even though he had lots of power and lots of influence in the nation, and obviously he had a, a direct line with God, it seems like, in this case. So, um, it's overwhelming and encouraging to get a message from God. Um, he received it. Again, he came to give him a message for the future. So next week when we meet together, we're going to pick up right here and we're going to see. Um, it's, it actually breaks into three components. I'm going to tell you the cliff notes right now. It talks about the, a little bit about the Persian, uh, Persian kingdom coming to an end. He describes it in detail three kings and then one that's really powerful and then it goes into a north kingdom and a south kingdom and those are the breakouts of the Grecian Empire after Alexander gets uh, dies and uh, the the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and their battle back and forth and it matches amazingly with scripture to see how guys giving their daughters in marriage to try to form a bond and then that one getting killed. And it's all described right here and, and we can look back and read the historical pages and it's just encouraging and amazing as I read this. No wonder the skeptical scholars look at this and say, well, that can't be prophecy, it's too accurate. I'm going, wait a second here, I thought that was a definition of what prophecy is. But it was just, it's a, the amazing accuracy of the prophetic utterance that's in there. So, and then finally it turns into Antiochus Epiphanes, and finally it talks about the Antichrist. So that's, that's, what, we're gonna, that's what you have to look forward to next week. Um, with that, I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Thank you all. Father, I praise you and thank you for this message. I thank you for the testimony of Daniel, his witness, his life, and his humbleness before you. God, instill in us a desire to please you and honor you like Daniel did. Give us wisdom to see your hand at work in our lives and to give you praise and honor and glory as a holy God. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen.